Okay, we are in uh, 1 Kings chapter 15. We have, um, obviously those of you who have been here know that the kingdom has divided. It's something like 700 years-ish after the, um, they entered Israel, or, or the land of Canaan, uh, and they divided the land up into numbers of chunks according to uh, certain guidance, and uh, everybody but the Levites got land. And in the course of time, they kind of rebelled against each other right after Solomon uh, passed away. They got mad at the guy that was going to be king of the whole thing, and they split themselves up. And uh, then we end up with the kingdom of Israel. Where are you? There you are. The kingdom of Israel up here, which is the majority of the tribes, and the kingdom of Judah down here, which is just a couple of tribes. Um, it works out. It's probably Judah, Benjamin, and Levi probably are in there. Um, and we were looking at the various kings. And as you recall, the first two kings of the divided kingdom were Jeroboam down in, uh, up in Israel and Rehoboam down in Judah. Now, as a general rule, I don't know if it's true or not, but I think of Judah as Israel, even though they're not called Israel. They're sort of the, um, what would we call it, the purer <laughs> part of, of the Israelites, because they still have the Davidic line of, of kings down in Judah, even though the name Israel is applied to the northern kingdom um, with most of the tribes up there. So Rehoboam is the son of um, of Solomon. Does anybody remember why the kingdom split up? It took me a second to remember, and I've been studying it. <laughs> right, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, up here, came into power, and everybody gathered around him, including Jeroboam, who is not of the kingly tribes. And they all said, lead us, but be gentle, because your father put huge burdens on us. And he says, come back in three days, and I'll let you know how it is. The young people told him, make it worse. The old people said, no, 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 you need to lighten up on them a bit. And of course, he followed the advice of his college buddies. And so he comes back and says, you know, I'm going to make it ten times worse than what my father did. He says, my, what was it, my little finger is going to be thicker than his waist. I think was the, I know it was his waist, and I think it was little finger, right? Huh? Oh, yeah? Okay. In other words, it's going to be worse. And so Jeroboam, who was ready to follow Rehoboam, is very upset, and so are ten of the tribes. And so they just go, we're going home. We're not going to have you. And so they made Jeroboam king, and Rehoboam took the, uh, the city of Jerusalem, the tribe of Judah, which was his tribe, eventually absorbed Benjamin, and by definition he had Levi because they are in Jerusalem running the temple. So we now have a divided kingdom because Rehoboam wanted to be a, a hard-nosed uh, leader instead of a more gentle leader, and so they split up. Um, we have already studied uh, his son Abijah, and we have just, last week we ended up with Asa, being king, and if you notice, Asa was king for a fairly long time, 912 to 872, which puts him overlapping Jeroboam by year, and all of these other kings coming down, let's see, 870, he passes through Ella, uh, Zimri, Omri, and he even gets down to Ahab, King Ahab, who everybody has heard of. So Asa goes a long, long time through a lot of kings. He goes all the way from Jeroboam to Ahab before his son Jehoshaphat takes over um, after Asa passes away. So we are at uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 15, verse 25. We've just finished talking about Asa becoming king, and Asa was a good guy. Uh, and so now we're going to back up. We had already finished Jeroboam. Now we're going to back up and talk about Nadab, and we'll talk about all these guys for a while before we come back over here. Um, yes? that kept the kingdoms divided was that Jeroboam said, okay, if I don't do something, I'll, I'll lose the people because they're going to go all the way back to Jerusalem to worship. Oh, yes, so continue. He set up all the high places for the people to worship so that they wouldn't have to go back to Jerusalem. 
Yeah, he was actually kind of smart. It was, a, it was a bad decision of how he implemented it, but he was smart because he figured after time, people would get over being mad at Rehoboam. They would see he probably wasn't really all that hard on the people after all. And they would go to Jerusalem to do their sacrifices, and after a while, that would just kind of call them back in. And so he was afraid, as, as you said, that uh, they would quit following him, Jeroboam, and, and go back to following Rehoboam. So he sets up a couple of um, high places and builds a couple of golden calves, as you may recall, and says, these are your gods, and he sets up a feast day that's equivalent to the Feast of Tabernacles Day, and so that way he keeps them. In fact, he even says, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. You can do it here, you know. And so, set up his own priests. So he, he really messed with it. Yeah, he messed with it. Well, as Solomon started it all, really, with, uh, with all of his wives, he set up high places for his wives. Yeah, these things were already in place. In fact, um, they already existed as places. And uh, so this stuff, the seeds of this, as you say, were sown during Solomon's reign because of all the foreign wives that he brought in who worshipped these strange gods and things. So, uh, chapter 15, verse 25, something just went strange there, okay. Chapter 15, verse 25, we're back up in the northern kingdom in Israel. Jeroboam has died. Um, we just finished last week talking about Asa and how he was a good guy uh, for the most part. And so now we're going to back up and do all the kings that were in Israel during Asa's reign. Uh, verse 25, chapter 15. And Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, so he was in the natural line, uh, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. So he, he started, if you notice, Asa overlaps Jeroboam by a full year, so Asa was into his second year. Um, uh, okay, I can't keep it straight. Anyway, he comes into power with Asa, king of Judah, and he reigns over Israel for two years, which is not very long. He did evil in the eyes of Jehovah, following the ways of his father and committing the same sin his father had caused Israel to commit, which was to follow false gods. Um, then Baasha, son of Ahijah, obviously not Jeroboam's son, Baasha, son of Ahijah from the tribe of Issachar, plotted against him, Nadab. Um, and struck him down at, uh, yeah, Gebethon, a Philistine town, while Nadab and all Israel were besieging it. So it says, But Asa killed Nadab in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and succeeded him as king. Um, so basically, it looks like this, this guy sneaked up on, on Nadab during, during a war and killed him. Kind of friendly fire. Not so friendly, but it would be classed as friendly fire. Uh, one of his own people killed him, or, or a guy at least in his own on his side of the army. Um, and so as soon as he began to reign, he killed Jeroboam's whole family. How nice. Um, he did not leave Jeroboam anyone that breathed, but destroyed them all according to the word of Jehovah given through his servant Ahijah the, the Shalonite. Uh, Ahijah, you may or may not recall, had predicted that this was going to happen just a couple of chapters ago because... Um, Jeroboam had been such a, such a, a nasty king. Uh, this happened because the sins Jeroboam had committed and had caused Israel to commit and because he aroused the anger of Jehovah, the God of Israel. As for the other events of Nadab's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? There was war between Asa and Baasa, king of Israel, throughout their reigns. Um, so it says, in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Baasa, son of Ahijah, became king, so he's going to kind of restart here, became uh, king over all Israel in Tizra, and he reigned 24 years. So he had a pretty long reign. Um, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the ways of Jeroboam, even though it wasn't his father, and committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. Um, then the word of Jehovah came to Jehu, or Yehu is how that's actually pronounced, which sounds funny in our language, son of Hanani uh, concerning Baasa. Now, here's what the word is. I lifted you up from the dust, because he wasn't of the royal lineage, 
and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. But you followed the ways of Jeroboam and caused my people Israel to sin and to arouse my anger by their sins. So I'm about to wipe out Baasa, using the third person with him, even though he's talking to Baasa, he's treating him as a third person. About to wipe out Baasa and his house, and I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Um, dogs will eat, the, this apparently is a big thing. Dogs eating your dead body was apparently a big thing with Jews. Um, they did not like that at all. Um, Honestly, I don't care what happens to my body after I'm dead. Uh, dogs will eat those belonging to Baasa who die in the city, and birds will feed on those who die in the country. As for the other events of Baasa's reign, which didn't do a lot that we hear of, uh, what he did in his achievements, apparently he did achieve some things, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of, of Israel? Baasa rested with his ancestors and was buried in Tizrah, and Elah, his son, succeeded him as king. So we have a dynasty going here at least a short-term one, um, of a man's son coming in, even though they are not from the kingly tribes, nor even from Jeroboam's uh, tribe. Moreover, the word of Jehovah uh, came, the word true is missing there, but it's helpful to put the word, the, the word of Jehovah came true through the prophet Jehu, or Yehu, son of Hanani, to Baasa and his house because, all of the e because of all the evil he had done in the eyes of the Lord, arousing the anger of, uh, by the things he did, becoming like the house of Jeroboam and also because he destroyed it. So you see the same routine happening over and over. It's almost a formula. You know, here's this guy, he comes into power, uh, he does bad, he reigns for so many years, he dies, uh, his other accomplishments are written in this book over here, which we may or may not have, and uh, then they move to another king. And this just goes over and over and over again, especially in uh, the kingdom of Israel early on. Uh, you see a lot, of, a lot of kings coming in here at this time. Uh, okay, we're in chapter, uh, chapter 16, verse 8. Uh, in the 26th year, okay, Asa is still king over in Judah. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, son of Baasa, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Tizra two years. So he, he reigns a short time. Zimri, one of his officials, you know, it would be terrible to be a king for a couple of years, and all they can say is that you reign for two years, and that's it. They didn't even say good, bad, or indifferent about the poor guy. I mean, his legacy is that he reigned for two years. Wow. <laughs> I would hope I would have somewhat more of a legacy than that if I were leader of a nation. Um, okay, that would, that would kind of like being, you know, president of the United States, pick one uh, for four or eight years and say he was president for four years. That's it. You know, did nothing in four years. Wow, that'd be terrible. Um, so Zimri... Um, Let's see, in the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah became king and reigned two years. He's done. Zimri, one of Elah's officials, uh, who had command of half of his chariots, plotted against him. So now we're going to find out why Elah died. Elah was in Tizra, which apparently was the uh, royal town at, uh, for them at the time. Uh, was in Tizra at the time, or at least it was the summer palace, let's say. Getting drunk in the home of Arza the palace administrator at Tizra. So a couple of old college buddies are over at his house getting stoned and watching the game. Um, and so they're sitting around drinking and watching the football game, I guess, or doing whatever they did 2,500 years, uh, 3,000 years ago, almost 3,000 years ago. Uh, the palace administrator, his, his right-hand man, his uh, chief of staff, Zimri came in, struck him down, and killed him in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah. Then he succeeded him as king. That would be kind of hard. They don't exactly say how he did that, but that would have been difficult. Just killing the king doesn't make you king. Uh, as soon as he began to reign and was seated on the throne, he killed off Baasa's whole family. This is not uncommon for royals to do. He did not spare a single male. And this is kind of interesting. It's usually the males they kill off, not necessarily the females. Um, he didn't spare a single male, whether relative or friend. So Zimri destroyed the whole family of Baasa in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken against Baasa through the prophet Jehu or Yehu uh, because of all the sins Baasa and his son Elah 
had committed and had caused Israel to commit so that they aroused the anger of the Lord, uh, the God of Israel, by their worthless idols. Um, that's an interesting phrase, worthless idols. He didn't just say idols, did he? He said worthless idols. Some people would argue that having any kind of religion would be helpful, but he said these, this religion was worthless, totally useless and worthless. As for the other events of Elah's reign, and all he did, are they not written in the book of the Annals of the Kings of Israel? So now we have the next guy. Zimri comes along, um, and we've already heard, he, he goes in and kills Elah. Um, and that's, so we're going to back up just a second. In the 27th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Zimri reigned. Now, this is kind of interesting. He killed Elah. Then he sat down on the throne, killed everybody in Ella's family, and now we hear the rest of the story. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned in Tizra seven days. He got to be king for a week. The army was encamped near Gibberthon, which is where he killed Ella. You remember? He sneaked up on him and killed Ella. So they, the army was still there. It's only been a week. Um, they, were, they were encamped there. When the Israelites in the camp heard that Zimri had plotted against the king and murdered him, they proclaimed Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel, that very day there in the camp. Uh, then Omer and all the Israelites with him, because they couldn't, they couldn't declare any of, of Eli's children uh, king because Zimri had already killed all of them in the past few days. Proclaimed Omri the commander of the army, so he's commander of, of the military. He was the high, high captain, the high uh, general, and so he became a military leader uh, in the camp. Then Omri and all the Israelites with him withdrew from Gibberthon, or Gibbethon and laid siege to Tizra, which is where Zimri was. When Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the royal palace, now this is really strange, and set the palace on fire around him. So he died because of the sins he had committed, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord and following the ways of Jeroboam and committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. As for the other events of Zimri's reign, I'm going to say, okay, they don't exactly exist <laughs> since he only lasted seven days. As for the other events of Zimri's reign and the rebellion he carried out, are they not written in the book of the Annals of the Kings of Israel? So this guy basically got to be king for a week. You've heard Queen for a Day, the show we, they used to have on TV, Queen for a Day. This was, guy was king for a week, and he ended up burning himself alive. Now that, that's a real heritage, isn't it? That's a, that's a, a legacy. Um, did what? I doubt it. He, the reference, of course, being to Nero fiddling while Rome burned. I, you know, this guy was probably so crazy, he, he didn't even know what he was doing, I suspect. I mean, who would set a building on fire around them and burn themselves to death? Well, I mean, it's easy to kill somebody else. It's a whole lot harder to burn yourself alive, <laughs> or it's easier, let's say. Um, but you've got to be a little bit crazy in, in, in that whole thing. Um, he probably had suffered from uh, narcissism and megalomania and three or four other big words um, that affect people like that. So, um, Omri is now king, and he was the commander of the army, so he's a military uh, leader. And it says in verse 21, Then the people of Israel were split into two factions, half supported Timbri, or Tibri, um, son of Genoth, for king, and the other half supported Omri. But Omri's followers proved stronger than those, he had the military probably behind him, they proved stronger than those of Timbri, uh, Tibri, I keep putting an M in there, uh, so Tibri died and Omri became king. Um, I'm thinking maybe he was killed. Uh, because it says he died. I think the, the writer is being gentle here. I think he was killed, probably. And so Omri becomes king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, so we're going through all these kings while Asa is king over in Judah, and he's a good guy. Uh, Omri became king of Israel, and he reigned 12 years, six of them in Tizra, which was kind of the, I guess, the summer palace area or whatever. 
Um, he bought the hill of Samaria from Shimmer for two talents of silver and built a city on the hill calling it Samaria after Shimmer's name, the name of the former owner of the hill. And we've all heard of Samaria, haven't we? There's where the city got its start, right there. Omri um, built, uh, bought the land from a guy whose name sounded a bit like Samaria or, or Shamer, um, Shamer. Shimmer, I guess is how it looks out, and maybe the pronunciation of the city was originally Shamaria or something like that. Um, anyway, that's where Samaria comes from. But Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. That would be hard to do, uh, but he apparently was successful in that regard, uh, in that negative regard. He followed completely the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit, that is, worshiping idols, so that they aroused the anger of Jehovah, the God of Israel, by their worthless idols. Did we just say worthless idols before? We did. He just said worthless idols, didn't he? Yep, there it is. Um, it keeps coming up, apparently. Um, No, they're not learning a thing, are they? They just keep doing this stupid stuff over and over and over again. And uh, this, is, this is called the definition of insanity. When you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results, that's called insanity. Now, I have a question for you. When you do the same things over and over again with a computer, you do get different results. What is that? I'm not sure what that is, but you actually can get different results with computers doing exactly the same thing over and over again. You would think that would be consistent, wouldn't you? But you come in one day, you do this, this thing, you get this result. You come in the next day, you do exactly the same thing, and you're not doing anything different. You're doing exactly the same thing, and you get a different result. And you go, now, wait a minute. If doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is insanity, what is going on here? Uh, maybe the computer's crazy. I'm not sure. Um, or... It, they have done as I predicted they would do. They, they go self-aware and they get mad at you and just do random things as a result um, of that. But anyway, these people did not learn from their mistakes. Now, we're going to learn why Zim, uh, Omri is so significant here. As for the other events of Omri's reign, what he did and the things he achieved, are they not written in the book of the Annals of the Kings of Israel? Omri rested with his ancestors and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, succeeded him as king. The only person I know of, other than this guy, who was ever named Ahab, was the guy who ran uh, the, uh, the ship in uh, Moby Dick, right? Wasn't he named Ahab? We just don't name our boys Ahab, do we? It's just not common. And what's the name we never name our daughters? Jezebel, which actually is a fairly pretty name, <laughs> but we just don't name our daughters that because his wife, Ahab's wife is Jezebel, and she's meaner than he is. Um, she, was, she was a bender. Um, so Ahab, his son, succeeds him. Uh, verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, so Ahab is still there uh, with Asa, um, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. Now, we're going to hear quite a lot about Ahab over the next several chapters. He's uh, famous enough to where they decided to just, you know, write a lot about him. Uh, he became Isra uh, king of Israel and reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. So he reigned quite long um, from Samaria. Notice that. Uh, Ahab, son of Omri, did more e boy, this is amazing, did more evil in the eyes of Jehovah than any of those before him. Now remember, Omri did evil more than everybody before him. So Ahab is even worse than his father, who was worse than everybody before him. So it just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, that, that is the, the idolatry sins, uh, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, who has the name of Baal, ba or Baal, uh, in his name. Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal, or Baal, and worship him. So he, 
He's got the golden calves, which were relatively benign as far as their practices were concerned. And now we've got Baal or Baal, uh, and that included some human sacrifice in that particular one, and so that was kind of nasty. Um, so he's, he's now doing, he's serving Baal, and he set up an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal and, that he built in Samaria. So now we've got all kinds of, of worthless idols. Ahab also made, here's the third one, made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of Jehovah the God of Israel than did all the kings of Israel before him and probably all the kings after. Uh, in Ahab's time, now this is an interesting side story, it's very short, but it, it harks back to somewhere between about 700 years earlier. Uh, in fact, why don't we go to Joshua 6.26, if I can get it to come up here before I read this. Let's go to Joshua. Uh, Joshua uh, 6 and 26. Whoops, come on. Now, remember in uh, Joshua, they were marching around Jericho, and it, the walls fall due to miraculous events on the part of God. Joshua 6.26 says, At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath. The walls have already fallen. Cursed be, cursed before Jehovah, is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations, and at the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. Now, that's a pronouncement that, that Joshua has made 700 years earlier. Now, that would be like 300 years before the first, you know, before St. Augustine was built in, in Florida. I mean, that was, goes way back. A long time ago, as far as our history would be concerned, we can't even think of 700 years before. That would be in like, what, the 1300s? Uh, for us, early 1300s, there was nobody except uh, the, the native populations here in the United States. There was no written history, no nothing. But anyway, he makes this pronoun pronouncement, and it says back in 1 Kings, verse 34, uh, chapter, I think, 16 is where we are. Yes. Um, in Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son Abiram, which sounds a lot like Abraham or Abram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, I guess that would be Sacob or Shacob, in accordance with the word of Jehovah spoken by Joshua son of Nun. It's very sad. 700 years earlier, Joshua had made this curse against the city of Jericho, and all that time passes, and this guy probably didn't even know about the curse. Why? Why would he not know about the curse? He never read it because they were worshiping all these idols, and a, a reasonably innocent thing that he did resulted in the loss of his oldest and youngest child. It doesn't say how they died, but, and again, last week we were talking about what's not, not fair. Well, this wasn't fair, you know. But we don't always know what's going on in the background. Um, of, of things, but this is, this is sad that his firstborn son and his youngest son, or his youngest, I, say, I guess it says, but um, uh, it, it was his youngest son, uh, passed away by some means. I'm going to guess, it doesn't say how they died, but I'm going to guess that they probably were accidentally killed during the construction work. Uh, I, that's just a guess. I, I don't have any idea. They may have died totally unrelated to that. But anyway, that's a side story on that. It's kind of sad. So, we are now up to chapter 17. We are still looking at Ahab, and the whole point of this whole study arises. Chapter 17. Now, Elisha, the Tishbite... Did I say Elisha? Thank you. Elijah, <laughs> he, 
his servant later on is going to be Elisha, and I always, I always have that problem. Now, Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe, that's easy to see, um, in Gilead said to Ahab, As Jehovah, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years. He's not specific. He just says the next few years, except at my word. Um, this is interesting. I'm not even sure Elijah was a Jew. It says he was a Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead. So he lived in the area, but he doesn't say, you know, he was of the tribe of, you know, X, Y, Z or anything like that. So I'm not even sure Elisha was a, was a Jew. Yet, uh, I, there I go again, Elijah. <laughs> okay, who can tell me what Elijah or Eliyah means? What does Eli mean? Anybody remember? means my God. L-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E, my God. Or God my. My God. L-E. Eli. My God. Yah. And we insert the verb. One would hope, but, but one doesn't know for certain. But he followed God. But yet Timothy was a great Jew and he didn't even, you know, he was a proselyted Jew. So maybe he was a proselyted Jew. I don't know. I know, but, but you know, the same, con just because your name, I mean, my name's Jewish, and I'm not Jewish. My name is Yosef, you know. I'm not Jewish. Um, anyway, I don't know. But he, his name means my God is Jehovah. Now, uh, later on, we're going to run up on his uh, guy who becomes his servant and his successor, whose name is Elisha or Elishua, perhaps. We already know what Eli means, or L-E, my God. And Sha or Shua, comes up a couple of times, like Joshua, which is also Yahshua. They didn't have J's. That came later. And Yeshua, which is the same thing as Joshua, and which is the same as Jesus as it goes through time, or Yesu. So Jesus' name in Old Hebrew would have been Joshua. So Yah is what? Jehovah. Shua, or Shah, means salvation or saves. So Elisha is my God saves, or my God is salvation. Remember Jesus, the angel said, you shall call him Jesus for what? He shall save his people. So his name, Joshua or Yeshua or Jesus, means Jehovah saves or Jehovah is salvation. Their names are very meaningful at times. Uh, Eli Elijah and Elisha separated. I can't. <laughs> just remember Paul and Timothy and Paul was the older one. That doesn't help me a bit. <laughs> well, you use Timothy as an example. Yeah, I was just looking at names. You know, he had a Greek name, but yet he was a, he was a proselyted Jew. You know. Um, okay. Here we go. So Elijah or Eli Yah, because there is no J in Hebrew, everything is pronounced as a Y sound. Um, thus, Yahovah instead of Jehovah. Uh, in, in Hebrew, if, if they remembered how to pronounce it, comes in, uh, says, it's not going to rain until I say. Uh, so it says, then the word of Jehovah came to Elijah, uh, uh, came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, hide in the Kareth ravine east of Jordan, because he's probably going to get killed if he doesn't. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what uh, Jehovah had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Um, sometime later, the brook dried up. Now, <laughs> it says because there was no rain. Uh, had not been any rain in the land. Why was there no rain? Because he had said there was not going to be any rain, so it, it actually affected him too. Uh, then the word of Jehovah came to him, go at once to, I have trouble with this name, 
Zarephath, I guess is how that's pronounced. Zarephath, I, I guess, any of those. It depends on how you want to put the accent on the uh, syllable. Um, how did you say it? Zarephath, okay. In the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to, Zer I can't say it, Zarephath, I guess. When he came to the town gate, a widow, and it's not sure which one we're talking about here. He almost implies there were two widows. I'm, I'm not sure. Came to the town gate. A widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may um, have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called out, you know, Oh, and while you're there, bring me a Big Mac. Um, uh, he says, Bring me, please, a piece of bread. The woman replies, As surely as Jehovah your God lives, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Because it was famine in the land. There was no rain. So this, this not having rain was affecting people who really didn't deserve to be treated this way, but that's one of the unfortunate aspects of, of plagues and, and bad weather. It affects everybody equally, I guess, or at least it can. Uh, so she says, I'm going to take it home, feed it to my son and myself, and then we're just going to starve to death and die. And we're going to find out later that this was a pretty young kid. Uh, Elijah says to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. Then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what Jehovah, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day Jehovah sends rain on the land. So basically a miracle is being performed here. Every time she takes grain out of the jar or olive oil out of the jar, it's replenished. Uh, this is a great miracle. Uh, and, and apparently she was worthy in some fashion, or at least God had chosen for her to be worthy in some fashion. And she is taking care of Elijah. Um, so she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. So she apparently had a family other than just the child. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil... Okay, she was a widow, so she must have had, like, brothers and sisters or, or cousins or uncles living with her. Uh, the jar, jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of uh, Jehovah spoken by Elijah. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse. I guess the woman owned the house. Um, he grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what did you have against me, uh, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, so apparently he wasn't that heavy since they could carry him. Uh, carried him to the upper room where, he was, where Elijah was staying and laid him on his, Elijah's bed. Then he cried to Jehovah, Jehovah my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with? By, see, he didn't understand either. By causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to Jehovah, Jehovah my God, let this boy's life return to him. Jehovah heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down to the room. Uh, in the house, he gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. The reason I'm concluding he was small because he was able to carry him. Uh, I, I don't know how old he was. Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of Jehovah um, from your mouth is the truth. So I'm, I'm not sure what the purpose of these miracles was, but it, it seems to have had some kind of purpose. She sees that he is a prophet from God, and she doubted. Um, and I don't know what part all of this plays in the whole story, but Elijah is, is treated as almost an equal by the Jewish people to Moses. Remember in the Transfiguration, one would have thought that Abraham and Moses would have shown up. In, in the Transfiguration, you know, the father of the first law, and the father, or the father of the patriarchal age, and the father of the mosaical age. You know, the two great foundational figures of, of, of the nation of Israel. No, it's Moses and Elijah. And he only appears between chapter 17 and the end of the book, and a few chapters into the next book. That's it. 
And so he becomes this mythological almost uh, figure to the Jews as somehow being on, on a par with, uh, with Moses. And uh, some people would ask, well, why did God choose to put him out there if he wasn't all that great? Well, maybe he was you know, as part of the transfiguration instead of Abraham. Maybe he was. Or maybe God just knew that they thought highly of him, and he says they'll, they'll think more highly of this if I bring him in. Um, God does a lot of things that help us that he might have done differently if we thought differently. Um, everything is not set in concrete. God accommodates us sometimes. And so the people have, have almost, almost deified, as they had Moses, uh, they, they somewhat deify Elijah as time goes on. What did they say when Jesus asked the question, who, who do people say I am? Well, you could have been John the Baptist or one of the prophets. And I don't think any of them said he was Elijah, did they? But when he cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? They thought he was calling Elijah. And they said, well, let's, let's sit around and wait and see if Elijah comes. And remember, there was a prophecy that said the, the, the Messiah wouldn't come until Elijah comes again. And Jesus pronounces John the Baptist as Elijah. He's the Elijah that was to have come. So Elijah figured very heavily in all this stuff, and we're now in the midst of Elijah. He's done a couple of miracles. He's actually, I guess, three, counting the uh, not letting it rain for a while. And so the people are suffering, and next time we will see how that turns out and one of the really really famous stories of the uh, actually a number of stories in fact if you were here for the uh, for the VBS they studied Elijah remember the the Everest thing that was up here most of the stories were about Elijah so it was kind of interesting that they they jumped into Elijah too at that same time okay it's 10 15 uh, now blessing may the Lord use your life as a blessing to others and a praise to his name through Christ our Lord.